Hello friends and welcome to another episode of Strength for Today with your host here, Eric Dijkstra. This week I'm really excited about what the Lord has to share and I'm encouraged and grateful and just appreciative of how the Lord reveals himself to us. And I wanted to extend last week a little bit. I know I ended with a bonus episode here on Saturday from a little book called Becoming the Beloved. And this was by a guy named Graham Cook, who uh, was very significant in some of my development and uh, formation. And really just last week talked about renewing our mind and cultivating the culture of our heart and really being able to receive from the Lord. And so this week, I just felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me to read some of these little exercises and excerpts that he really calls soaking. And just to give you a little bit of a window into my life and how significant this was for me is uh, this was something that was new for me several years ago. And just being able to listen with the ears of my spirit and um, really to perceive uh, the voice of the Lord. And a lot of times for me growing up, it was uh, significantly about reading the word of God. And one of the practices and creative ways of hearing the word of God is reading it out loud and hearing God's voice uh, through someone else reading and speaking as from the Father. This isn't saying that we can um, take the place and, and become the voice of God, but what I am saying is that God can often use our voice as a tool and as an instrument to speak his truth and his heart into ours. And so I just want you to really get in a posture. I want to start this week off by simply just reading uh, this thing, uh, this passage from Becoming the Beloved. And I just want you to kind of listen and receive more than anything. And once you listen to it and we listen to the rest of the episode, I would encourage you just to go back and listen to it again, maybe several times. And don't try to take notes. Don't try to... Um, kind of regurgitate what you hear, but one of the things that I want you to do is just really catch it in your spirit. And as I started to do this, what I started to notice happened inside of me is that there was a strength that began to emerge and I started to hear the voice of God. And as I heard God's voice, uh, as these things were read over me as from his heart, it solidified something in me so that I could really become it. And it became a reality It's something that I felt deeply because God just didn't give us his word in order for us to understand it logically or uh, in our reason, but he really gave it to us as well to feel it. And a lot of times, especially in our Western culture, we dissociate the two. We come to a scripture and his word in terms of being able to understand it and we dive in and we dig in and try to find uh, the meaning. And I'm not saying there's not a place for that, but that's a very left hemisphere oriented approach to reading and hearing God's word when uh, the more dominant side of our brain on the right, which is relational, uh, really helps us to engage and connect at a heart level with the words that Christ speaks to us through his word but also through the form of other people and in their voice. And um, so I would just encourage you to try something new and to stretch a little bit. And part of creating that growth mindset is really being able and willing to go to places that maybe we haven't been before. Uh, there's a scene from one of my favorite movies, the first Lord of the Rings movie, where uh, Frodo actually gets the ring and he's setting out from the Shire where it's a, uh, it's a place where they're comfortable uh, nothing really changes and they don't go on adventures and they just want to be safe creatures. And so he's got this task and this mission to go and destroy this ring of evil. And his friend Sam is going with him and they're journeying out and they come to the edge of the Shire and it's all, the only thing they've ever known in their life. And so Frodo is walking ahead and he notices that Sam, his friend, is no longer with him. And he looks back and Sam can't get himself to come to cross that line. So Frodo walks back into uh, being right next to him. And he says, Sam, what's the matter? And Sam just smiles at him and he looks and he says, Frodo, if I take one step further, this will be further than I've ever gone before. 
And that was a scene that really struck me because I feel like that's the way the Lord works in our lives is he just invites us and he never moves too far ahead of us. And he recognizes where we're at. He recognizes where you're at in your journey. And just like Frodo comes back and stands next to Sam, I just see the Lord doing that with us. No matter where you're at, he comes back for you and he says, it's going to be okay because I'm going with you. So the Lord's just inviting us into new places. And part of a growth mindset, part of cultivating our heart is, is being willing at times to be stretched and to try new things. Um, and obviously there's parameters and boundaries that you want to set up. Uh, you know, does it align with the word of God? Does it sound like something God would do in his, is it in his character? Does it produce the fruit of the spirit within us? And um, there's a lot of boundaries. You know, you can't just be careless and reckless about the things that you're listening to um, because there are uh, a lot of things that can deceive as well that are partial truths or a uh, counterfeit of what the truth is. And so I just want you to read. I just want you to receive these words as I read them over you. And I felt that it was fitting to read something to you from this. And there's six different passages here. And this one is called Seeing What God Sees. And for me, this was really critical to understand sometimes and really believe what God sees in you. So hear this from God and from his heart towards you today. And I just want to encourage you again to just listen with your heart and, and let your heart capture the phrases that really bring life and become aware and just become sensitive of them. So enjoy, sit back, relax, and just receive. He says, my beloved has the capacity to see what I see. When your heart is engaged with mine, your view of life and circumstances can rise above your situation. The kingdom is filled with my vision and my perception. To become the beloved, you must see yourself as I see you. You are the beloved because of who I am, not because of what you see about yourself. It is my perception of you that must occupy your affection, my appraisal of you that must gladden your heart. You are accepted in my beloved son. Therefore, you are my beloved child. Rest in my acceptance of you and my affection for you. My beloved has my fullest attention. All the intention of my heart is joyfully lavished upon you. I have a huge heart of affection towards you. And my love never ceases and never fails towards you. My love is not based upon your performance as the beloved. It is based on the sacrifice of my beloved son. He alone is the propitiation for your sin and your restoration. I place you in him so that all the love I have for him may now rest joyfully in you. And I completely understand every struggle that you have and every weakness that you fear about yourself. In my great love for you, I have set aside a place in my beloved for you to enjoy and know my fullest affection. Again, let me say to you, rest in my love. I love you as I love Jesus. Abide in this place of my deepest affection. And when I look at you, I do not see anything wrong or negative about you. I took everything that could ever be leveled against you, every sin, accusation, and even the smallest amount of sin, and I placed it on Christ and nailed it to a tree. I have dealt with sin once and for all in this world. The next I deal with sin will be on Judgment Day, after the world has ended. Until then, I am dealing with your righteousness in Christ. I have placed you in him so that his purity and holiness can now become you as you learn to live in him. He is my beloved son. And now that you are in him and he is in you, you also are the beloved. Therefore, when I look at you, I see him first. I see you through the lens of Jesus. 
by my doing, you are in Christ, the beloved of heaven. He has made your wisdom and your righteousness. In him, you are set apart and consecrated. You are fully redeemed and learning to walk in the fullness of all that Christ is in you. When I look at you, I do not see what is wrong with you. I see what is missing from your experience of the Christ. I am fully committed to you becoming the beloved. That means I am always upgrading your experience in relationship with Jesus. You are growing up into all things in him with my blessing and approval. In Christ, I give you all the things that you lack in yourself. As the beloved, you inherit all that he is and all that he can do. And I just want to encourage you to go back and just listen to those words and let them wash over you as he is speaking them into your heart. And the reason I chose this is because as a believer, one of the first foundational truths that we have to get internally inside of us is the truth that we are accepted. And we have to learn to see ourselves the way that he does. And I love that line in this one that God the Father sees us through the lens of his son, Jesus. There are so many rich truths that I've just allowed to soak into my spirit. And I'll, sometimes even before bed or when I get up in the morning, I'll just listen to this and let those words wash over me as the Father speaks them and just being aware of what it creates internally and how it makes me feel. And I love that aspect is that my full attention is towards my beloved. Child, you are the beloved today. You have his full attention. What is it that you want to do and partner with God to accomplish today in your world? I love that phrase, abide in his deepest affection towards you. One of the other pieces that was highlighted, it was this phrase of when I look at you, I do not see what is wrong with you, but I see what is missing from your experience in Christ. The good news of the whole uh, life of Jesus was that he came in and he took away our sins so that he could reconcile us back to the Father and live in right relationship with you. As a new covenant believer, you have that privilege today of walking in the newness of life. And he is so pleased. He is so proud. And he is so affectionate towards you. And his greatest desire is coming before you and inviting you in to one of the most incredible relationships that you could ever experience because he's a good father. I had a friend who had, a, I can't remember if it was a vision or a dream. And in this dream or vision, he saw the father walking towards him. And as the father walked, he had this stern face uh, uh, that, that he could see. Um, and as he got closer, he heard the Lord say to him, give it back. And then he was startled by this at first. And he said, well, what do you mean? I, I didn't take anything. I don't, I, I'm not. I don't, not, I don't have anything that's yours. And then he said again in a firm voice, give it back. And then he said the second time, well, I don't have anything. What do you mean? And the third time he said, give me back my stuff. And he said, Lord, I, I don't have anything that's yours. And at this point, he said in his dream or in his vision, he began to be upset. And as he became upset, the Lord just smiled at him and said, your sin, your shame, the guilt that you're carrying. And he just kind of listed all these things. And he said, that was for my son, Jesus, to carry. And he carried it once and for all at the cross. And he had no intention of you picking it back up and taking it upon yourself. And that's the image that I had of the father just walking into your world, walking into the very room that you're in today with his uh, eyes of fire, with his loving compassion, his mercy and his grace 
just extending his hand towards you and inviting you to come closer, to draw near to who he is. Just like the prodigal son, even when he had gone out and spent everything that his father had given him and lost everything, when he came back home, his father was there waiting and celebrated and threw a party for his son. It's not promoting that, uh, that you can just go and live a careless life, but know this, that the father welcomes you back with open arms and his loving embrace wants to be uh, everything that you could ever have imagined or wanted or desired in a loving father. And he doesn't see the things that are wrong. He simply just puts his finger ever so lightly on, on those areas of our life where we're missing him or we're missing something that he wants to give. And so maybe the posture to kind of close this episode is just to reach your hands out. And I often do this is just put my hands up in kind of this posture of surrender and just ask the Lord, Lord, I give to you the things that I'm carrying in my heart that are blocking and hindering uh, me from receiving your grace, your love. And I just surrender my heart and I give it to you so that I could be full of the Holy Spirit, so that I could receive the gifts of your wisdom and understanding, and that I could encounter and experience you on a daily basis. And then just receive the Lord. And I would just ask this simple question, Lord, is there something that you want me to have? I call it a divine exchange where we come and we lay our burdens before him and we give them to him because he took them and he doesn't want us to pick them back up. But often when we surrender to him and give these things to him, he often gives us something much more um, precious and beautiful than what we give to him. So we give and exchange uh, the sin, the guilt, the shame, the burdens that we often carry because we don't see ourselves the way that God does, but G God sees us through his son, Jesus, and he gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us, um, to help to, just to live in the character of Christ and to be transformed into his image. So be encouraged by that today. And I want to close just with this scripture that God brought to mind. And it's one of my favorite stories in Luke chapter 19, where Jesus approaches Zacchaeus. And Jesus is coming into the city and Zacchaeus is gone and made his way up in a tree. I'm sure you can remember that song because it said Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in that sycamore tree. But have you ever thought maybe why Zacchaeus would have gone up into a tree? I mean, think about his life. He was a guy that not many people liked. He often came around the doors and uh, knocked and collected money because he was a tax collector and they, they weren't receptive or they weren't received in that society and culture. And I often wonder that if he, Zacchaeus kind of climbed up in that tree for his own safety because there was a huge crowd, it says. Either way, it doesn't matter why Zacchaeus was in a tree. But what I do notice in that is that Zacchaeus took notice of what Jesus was doing. And he had heard about what Jesus was doing and who he was. And so he was curious. And so he gets up in this tree and he's watching as Jesus enters the city and this huge crowd is gathered. Now think about being in a big crowd where the person you're there to see locks eyes with you and he calls you out by name. He says, Zacchaeus, come down for I must come and dine at your house today. Mm. That's how intentional the Lord is. I mean, he had a word of knowledge and he gave it and he spoke Zacchaeus' name and he says, Zacchaeus, he calls him out by name and he says, come down and he goes to him. And I love in the English Standard Version, it said this, he says, I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully as he came down and was obedient to the word of Christ. 
that's the posture I hope is cultivated in our heart and what renewed thinking can do is that it produces uh, joy, which I've defined as glad to be with you. And out of all the people around him, I'm sure Zacchaeus felt connected and attached to Jesus in that moment because Zacchaeus or Jesus saw Zacchaeus, called him down. And then when they're having dinner at Zacchaeus' house, it's very interesting what happens. I talked several weeks ago about one encounter that Paul had with Jesus and how it changes his life. Notice it says, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's good news. It's incredible news. And I know it gives me strength and I hope it does for you today. And now that's the fruit of one encounter with Jesus. Could you have imagined after Zacchaeus has this encounter, he goes back into the city and he starts knocking on doors and of those that he knows he's taken money from. Could you imagine being on the other side of the door seeing Zacchaeus as you open the door thinking, great, what's he going to take now? And instead of taking something, Zacchaeus humbles himself and he says, um, hello, I'm, I'm Zacchaeus and, and you probably know me and I'm usually here to collect things. But today I want to give you back four times more than what you gave me. And could you imagine Zacchaeus taking out a bag and you're wondering, well, what's in it? Is it real money? Is it bugs? What could it possibly be? And as he hands it over and you take it, you feel the weight of the bag and you, you feel it and you look inside of it and it's money. And sure enough, it's four times the amount that you had ever given him. Now that's the fruit of having an encounter with Jesus. Now one encounter begins to impact the entire city because could you imagine that entire city seeing the life of Zacchaeus turned around? And one of the other things I thought was really interesting is that when Jesus called out Zacchaeus and he went and had dinner with him, what was happening in the crowd? Some of the religious leaders became angry. Some of the other people thought, well, why is he going to eat with him? That guy just takes money from us. He's a tax collector of all things. But Jesus uses this example in public so that he could illustrate to them the power of his love and his grace and his mercy and how it can turn a life around. And when he turns our heart to him and our eyes lock onto him, an entire city is, is impacted. It's like that scripture in Matthew where it says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden under a basket or a light on a hill must shine and be a beacon of hope and light. And that's what Zacchaeus became in his city. That's what one encounter can have with Jesus. And it really comes back down to seeing ourselves the way that God does through the lens of Jesus. So I would encourage you to go back before Wednesday to listen to this. And here's just something that you can do as well. And I often do these little I call them kind of prophetic acts where it's doing something literally to symbolize something that has happened internally, much like baptism and communion is. There is a symbolism there. There is something that happens within our spirit as we engage these things. And I saw this example uh, several years ago of just imagining yourself and the lens that you're seeing the world through. Imagine yourself, and if you got to put glasses on, go ahead and find a pair of glasses and put them on. And this is the lens that we see the world through, through the eyes of the flesh, through the eyes of the world. And now what I want you to do is just picture yourself taking those off, setting them down, and putting on spiritual glasses that you could see and perceive through the lens of the spirit. And you're now able to see things that you couldn't see before. So pick up those new glasses and put them on and remind yourself daily, am I seeing myself through the lens of Jesus Christ, the way my father sees me? 
And am I seeing the world through the same lens that Jesus sees it, full of grace, full of compassion, just like he had for Zacchaeus and how it changed his life. I encourage you today to be strengthened because you are the beloved and you are becoming his beloved. So as you're transformed, may you be strengthened in the truth and the grace of God today. God bless. Come back Wednesday as I'll share one more example from this little devotional. I'll just read it over. But until then, God's strength.